what it is about video. For some reason, maybe it's because it's a captive audience. <laughs> maybe it's because I know you don't really have to watch or listen to this. But one of the things that we've done in video, more so than probably some of the other ministries that I've seen, is you know we go ahead and talk about every subject and any subject, no matter what the subject is. And one of the things that I really like to talk a lot about, <laughs> okay, maybe I don't talk a lot about it, but one of the things I like to bring up that people don't seem to pay attention to is death. Yeah, you know, dying. You know, the thing that most people in America try to not talk about, try to ignore, try to pretend it's the elephant in the room that we just don't bring up in, you know, polite topic discussions over dinner table or breakfast. But the fact is, we should be preparing for death. We should always be wary of or aware of the fact that we are mortal. We will die. You will face the reality of your mortality. And maybe people in their elder years look at it more realistically than in their younger years. Maybe they do. Now, I'm kind of weird, but you've already figured that out if you've seen a video of mine, but I'm kind of different, you know, because God saved me, and I'm not always confident of why he did, but I'm pretty sure that I got a handle on possibly some of the reasons was because he wanted me to bring up things that maybe people wouldn't talk about. And so, early in my Christian experience, when I got saved in the Jesus movement, you know, I had some wonderful, you know, opportunities to learn very quickly and have all these different, you know, gifts of spirit, and, you know, things happen that most people want, and, you know, in the Jesus movement, people were wanting to get this. Well, I didn't know what it was, but I wound up getting it, you know, and it's like, oh, wow, that's cool. You know, and then this happening, and, you know, everybody wanted that to happen to them, and, you know, some did, some didn't, but it happened to me, and it's kind of like, well, that was cool. But the problem with all of that was that I got all this stuff so cool, you know, at the beginning, was that, like Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. And quite frankly, within the first, oh, I don't know, two years of being a born again Christian, I was suddenly thrown into and cast into this place of facing death. You see, I was told that I had an incurable disease. I was told that I was going to die before I was 30. As a matter of fact, I lived my next 10 years of my life expecting to die before I was 30. And quite frankly, it looked like I was going to die quite a few times. I nearly died two or three times from just some bad surgeries and from some bad blood and just different things that happened you know, in my hospital stays that usually last as long as one time, almost a year. And I remember my last surgery nearly killed me. It was that they had done the surgery as a mandatory thing and quite frankly I barely survived coming out of it and then once I was out of the surgery they had a policy that they couldn't keep me in the hospital anymore so being that it was the VA hospital and that it was non-service connected all kinds of weird things that were happening in those days under Reagan <laughs> but anyways under those days when things were going kind of crazy in the economies they didn't know what to do with me you know they, they had tried to save my life, but then if I didn't recover and gain some weight quickly, if I didn't begin to make some progress, then I would just, as I had seen many other people in my condition, kind of like fade away. You see, there is a certain aspect to suffering and to misery that can cause the body to deteriorate to a point where even though you may survive the surgery, you may not recover the recovery process. And I was down to Oh, I guess, I don't know, maybe it was 90 pounds that time. I'd been down even lower than that once in my life. But I was probably about 100 pounds maybe, you know. And they really couldn't afford to, you know, fatten me up like they had in previous years, you know, with interlipids and, you know, giving me all these intravenous things because my veins were shot. <laughs> I'd had a lot of surgeries. And quite frankly, you know, they, they kind of really didn't want to deal with me because they still had that idea that... Uh, you know, maybe he'll survive, but 
Probably won't. So they shuffled me off to this domiciliary care, you know, that they had a vacancy that, thank God, one of the doctors decided to, you know, shuffle me in and do some fast paperwork, you know. I managed to get in there, you know, and it was pretty sad and pretty depressing the times that I spent there. But the amazing thing was, being a boarding and Christian, guess what? I lived. But the point I wanted to bring up was that the very first time that I was told, and it wasn't only one time I was told this, but the very first time that the doctor came in and said, got some bad news, Michael, you know. I mean, he didn't say it that way. He just flat out came out and told me straight direct. He says, you probably aren't going to live past 30, so you need to get your house in order. And I looked at him and I just was shocked. I remember just sitting there thinking, well, Lord, now what are you going to do? Because you see, as a Jesus freak, I had a personal relationship with God. Everything that I did and everywhere I went, I always had my backpack full of Bibles and and commentaries, well, not commentaries, but full of a Bible. I always had a Bible. I had Streams in the Desert. I had Strong's Concordance. And I had, I think, Daily Light, maybe. And my utmost was highest. Because I could always get those, well, a couple of them free. And the one that I bought, the Strong's Concordance, was a paperback version that was like only nine bucks. But because I was always in the hospital, I always had my backpack full of that, and I would, you know, read my Bible and you know study. And, you know, I didn't have really cassette player <laughs> to listen to tapes. Didn't have iPods in those days, and you know, even Walkman hadn't really come out yet. I think it might have just been breaking loose. And quite frankly, I didn't have the money most of the time, anyways. But as a person, as a young man in his twenties, as a young individual facing death and being told by a certified genuine surgeon and then later from a regular doctor and then also later from a social security doctor even by all three doctors being told that I was going to die it was pretty challenging for me in my faith as well as in my walk in life and the way that I approached living because what happened to me was that in the first time that I got saved, you know, as a born again Christian, it was as though my eyes opened up and I could see everything better. You know, there was this sharpness and this clarity, this dexterity of being able to see things in a different light, to be able to understand them in a different way. And that was amazing to me. It was as though there was enhanced sensory perception. You know, kind of like the things they talk about doing with, you know, uh, different either drugs or different abilities or capabilities within the synopsis of the brain, being able to make connections that you know enhance your ability to think, see, comprehend, or to make connections. And so that happened for me spiritually, you know, which was kind of cool. Then later on, being baptized in the Spirit, I had a marvelous experience there too. Then later on, which was amazing, was that just like most people will tell you, and I learned when I went to Modesto JC to study death and dying with Cougar Ross studies, and to get my mental health certificate so I could go visit people that were dying in the hospital, that um, people that go through the first awareness of being told that they're going to die, suddenly it's like a shock to their system. They suddenly have a better appreciation for life itself, everything around them. Their senses are enhanced. It's called an enhanced sensory perception or a, the, the reality of what happens is that the body suddenly focuses in on different things that, while on the one hand, when you're not caring about living, you are more of a mentation person. You're thinking all the time. You think, think, think. But when you realize you're going to die, suddenly things around you take on a very important priority, and you focus in on it. You notice a flower more acutely. You notice the wall and the grain in the wall. You notice the floor if it's swept or little dust particles. You can see light as though it were shining through the window, you know, and it's kinda like, you know, the little filters of dust that you see on it, like rays. Well, you become aware, they say, of your surroundings. Kinda like what some people do when they go into these, you know, focused, specialized groups to enhance their sensory perceptions or to understand the life they're living around them. Well, that happened to me too, you know, when I was dying. So, in each one of these different experiences, it was different. The one for dying was different than the one with the Holy Spirit. The one for the Holy Spirit was different than when I first got saved. And everything was a little bit different. So, God used those things in my life always to understand where people were coming from 
but to also relate to people to prepare them for what they might be going through. And that's the point that I wanted to bring up was that you should be preparing, really, to die. No, seriously. I mean, I just read today that someone, you know, how you always hear these things, some movie star died, you know, and all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, oh, well. Or, you know, you read about some eulogy of somebody, how wonderful they were, and if you happen to know the person, you go, well, they weren't that wonderful. As a matter of fact, it's kind of humorous with that. I remember when I was uh, helping this church get started in Klamath Falls, Oregon, I remember the first time my mother, myself, and my sisters, we all had a, a wake, so to speak, or we all had a service, you know, for my grandmother, because she had, my mother had brought her to Klamath Falls to die, because she was throat cancer, and, you know, really kind of bitter, and kind of like, really a, a lost soul, so to speak, you know, because she was very, very ex-Catholic, and kind of like, well, just a mess, you know, her life had been really rough. She'd gone through some tough stuff. And while my mother was, you know, truck stop waitress and pretty, you know, mouthy and sarcastic, and then later got saved and still was mouthy and sarcastic, but in a different way. Um, my grandmother was like, wow, you know, really pretty messed up. And so she came to, you know, Klamath Hall basically to die and was in the nursing home until she died and passed away from throat cancer and died horribly, really, you know, gagging and choking to death, bluntly. And so while there was sorrow beforehand, you know, and kind of like, I didn't want to go visit her because it was like, oh, disgusting. After she died, we were all shook up. We were like, my mother said she had witnessed to her, so we were, you know, and she said that she had accepted Jesus, the, the fact of what Jesus had done on the cross and saved her. So anyways, long story short, she had shared with her the gospel, you know, the way my mother does, and however she did, and whatever she did. But I trust her, and I believe it. And so when it came time to bury my grandmother, so to speak, and to let go of, you know, our memories of her, we were all partying. We brought all the kids together, you know, and we talked about my grandmother, and we were laughing and carrying on, and the, the pastor wasn't quite sure what to do with us. He was kind of like, well, you know, ready for grief counseling, and you know, he was ready for all these things that he thought that he was prepared for, and he thought he knew about, which he was a young pastor. And, uh, we didn't. We were like kind of, we sang some songs, we enjoyed ourselves, we had a good time, you know, and, and we let her go. Because, you see, we fully expect to see her because we prepared for ourselves for eternal life. And that was what we already expected that if she's there, we've done everything we can to assure ourselves that she is. And if she isn't, then she had every chance she could have. So that's the point. The person that dies according to the book of Romans, has every opportunity to know God. And if they do choose to reject God, then of course they wind up in hell. But they did have the opportunity to know Him. They choose to reject Him, is what the Bible says. And that's where we get to that place of acceptance or rejection on a personal basis. I don't know and don't care what church people go to. It doesn't matter. That's not the issue. The point is whether you prepare yourself to meet Jesus in eternity. Because if he knows you, then you wind up spending eternity with him in heaven, as well as a thousand years on the earth, you know, that's coming and all that stuff, you know, you've read about in the book of Revelation and, you know, all that other good stuff in new heaven, new earth, and that there's ages to ages life that's going to happen, you know, and it's going to keep going on and on and on and on, because the soul's eternal. But likewise, the souls that have rejected him, of course, they have to be in a place of that corruption that God has placed only really his fallen angels, but now has to put humanity there that has corrupted themselves to the point of rejecting their own creator. Makes perfect sense to me. If you have something that's corrupt, you can't put it in a place of perfection, it would be consumed. And that's kind of what really the lake of fire sounds like to me. It sounds like imperfection in the presence of perfection. So it's continually burning and just being consumed in agony. So, the bottom line is that, are you prepared to die? Now, the reason I ask that is because, you know, there's some famous pastors I know, you know, that I've heard their testimony about one of their loved ones dying, you know, like Greg Laurie or, you know, other people that have gone through some tragic, they say, loss of some loved one. I don't find my experience like theirs. You know, they, they were pretty shook up, pretty messed up, and pretty challenged 
Well, at the same time, you know, they went on with their ministry and they went on, you know, and dealt with it. And, you know, they were glad to have all the cons comforting and consoling. But I think if they would have prepared themselves for the reality of death every day, then the fact they pass on into life eternal would be more of a rejoicing than it would be of a sorrow. There wouldn't be a hanging on or a clinging to memories of fellowship when there's something greater going to be experienced very soon with them. And that will be to reunite with them in heaven, as well as, you know, to see them again here on earth once Jesus comes back. But what are you doing about your death? What are you preparing for in your life? You didn't just suddenly appear, you know, and plopped out and somebody had, you know, a big bowel movement and you were born. No. The fact is, whether you recognize it or not, according to the Bible, you were planned out. You were designed and you have a purpose. Your whole existence for being, as well as life that you're living, has a reason. So there is also with that, if you already know that, there's a reason for your death. And there's a reason to go through that. The Bible says that death has no sting to us who know God. That death has been swallowed up in victory. And that we can rejoice in the fact that we move on into something that we don't understand or comprehend, possibly with what we can see right now, but that we know people that have been there. And I don't mean people that you know die and have this heaven experience. No, we have people that were written in the scriptures. Jesus himself said, hey, I came down from heaven to explain it to you. Paul said, hey, a man in the body, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but you know, he ascended to the highest heavens, you know, and there saw things that would be sinful to even speak of, but he spoke of some of them. Um, John himself went to and was taken up into heaven and explained and given us the entire book of Revelation so we would know what's coming. We would see and be able to comprehend the things that are happening in heaven. There's no question as to what's going on. We have a record of it. And that's the point that I need to mention to you. Get ready, you know. Get ready to die because that will enhance your life. If you realize that there is nothing to fear about death, then you're not like a 20-year-old who ignorantly risks his life thinking that he's indestructible, but that you recognize that the reality of life is an illusion and that you're passing from one existence into a dimensional reality of a spiritual existence that's going to be greater than what you're experiencing now. Something far more than what you've ever known if you were choosing to accept the record that God has given to us, which is from His Son. And if you accept that the person who came down from there has a eyewitness account of it, Jesus, then you accept the idea that He knows what He's talking about and you can prepare yourself for heaven. You can prepare yourself for death. You can prepare yourself for real life that's going to be lived. Now this life is good. Don't get me wrong. God created it. And when he got done creating, he said it was good, and then man came along, screwed it up, and guess what? <laughs> With Satan's help, you know, somehow the world's gotten pretty corrupt. And it doesn't take a genius to look around and see how much corruption there really is in the world. When I look at these flowers that are blooming next to me, I know that only part of the plant really is blooming. Part of it is kind of like wilted, and part of it is kind of like struggling to really blossom. When that curse off of creation is lifted, man, that plant's going to, like, just cook when it comes to blooming and that's the way that life will be for we who know the author of life the giver of life the creator our father and that's why we should prepare in living our life day to day with the reality of knowing that death has no power over us there's no fear of it but there's no reason to not prepare for it there's no reason to not abide in the knowledge that you're not going to be here you're not going to live forever, not in this particular place and time in the way that you're seeing it. You're going to live forever as far as your soul is concerned and your spirit, but as far as the reality of you being in this physical body, I don't know about you, but you know, I've noticed that my, my flesh is kind of like you know deteriorating away, and just like the doctors and surgeons said, it's dying. Now, it is a shock to them that I'm alive. <laughs> And quite frankly, when I got past 30 
and when I was finally around 35, I kind of went, well, I guess I'm not going to drop dead. <laughs> by the time I hit 40, I went, hmm, guess I'm going to stick around a while. You know? And by the time I hit 50, well, the truth is, I never really completely expected to die because there was a time about the, I think the third doctor told me that I was going to die. Uh, it might have been the Social Security doctor. Yeah, he said, it was kind of interesting the way he put it because in those days, they got away with more than what they get away with now. And I remember him telling me, look, if you go into a closet, you're going to die. If you stay you know, working, you're going to die. If you sat at home and just collected Social Security, you're going to die. But either way, you're going to die. So what difference does it make? And I thought, that's one cold-hearted black bastard. I wish I'd recorded that. You know? I mean, I was really mad. <laughs> I walked out of there really depressed. And when I talked to my lawyer, he you know, took care of it, and I wound up on Social Security for a short period of time. You know, disability. But I took myself off because when I finally, you know, was like healthy, I said, you know what? I just can't sit here and collect free money. I need to work, so I went to work. But the point of it all being is that when that doctor had told me that no matter what I did, I was going to die, I went home and I read a scripture that says, "I shall not die, but declare His glorious works." From the Psalms, I forget which Psalm it is. I think it's Psalm. Uh, 35, somewhere right around there, when it says, I shall not die, but declare his works, you know, and the things that he's done. And that's what God did. God took me through these life experiences in order to share them with people that would go through the same experiences. That they would know that there's someone who's been there, done that, experienced it, know it, you know, realized it, had that same fear, had that same anxiety, but overcame it. And I didn't overcome it by something I did. I overcame it by something that God did in me. You see, that's part of what that part in Revelation says. Those that overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and loving not their lives even unto death. Well, at that point in time, I wasn't really worried about dying anymore. I, I told the Lord, hey, you know, if I live or if I die, fine, God. It's, I'm yours, you know. I've done, you know, maybe I don't get to do everything I wanted to do, you know, like write books and, you know, do videos and do all this stuff that I do now. <laughs> Talk, you know, walk, eat, drink, you know, screw up, be forgiven, you know, walk, <laughs> you know, act like a normal human being. But God chose rather to make me an example and to give me the opportunity to use my life's experiences so that He would be glorified, not me. Because in me, there's well a good thing. I have nothing good of myself. I'm not like some kind of a miracle because I'm not, you know, healed. I still have consequences to the actions that have been taken on me. I wear an awesome bag. I have my hands cut up. But I can eat things that are good. I can eat everything. I mean, really, I eat everything. I can eat like five feet, soon six thousand calories. I mean, I've done things that most people in my condition, they say, not a chance, and yet I did it. Matter of fact, last year, last winter, I even got fat. That's really weird. I've never been fat in my life. I got up to like almost 200 pounds, and I thought, oh my God, I need to lose weight. You know, it scared me. So I started losing weight, and my wife started losing weight, and both pretty much got back down for me. Slim and trim. <laughs> you know, but the point of it is, preparing yourself die will give you a better life. Preparing yourself to know that you were dying so that you could live is a good perspective to have. Jesus said, watch and be ready for you know not the hour nor the day that the Son of Man will return. And he didn't mean that only in some kind of rapture way. He meant that you don't know the day or the hour that you could drop dead. You could have an you could have a blockage, you could have a heart attack, you could have a stroke. You could be killed by a drug driver, or you could be shot by a gang banger, you know. You could wind up suffering the consequences of the world at its face and wind up dying from cancer or something. You could, in other words, fulfill what God has said, that the number of a man's days, that a man should number his days, you know, and be sober-minded in these last days that we see, because the world will come to an end, there's no doubt. The same way we know that you and I will come to an end. 
we will come to a place of ending this physical existence that we live in, this body of flesh that we inhabit, and discover there's more to life than sucking your thumb. There's more to life than just this body that we were given, or that incorporates a lot of marvelous medical wonders that you could cut it open and see all kinds of neat things. But you know, when they cut it open and they mess with the brain and all these other things, they still can't figure out the soul. Sure, they see where the center of emotions and the synoptic connections and those kind of things make electrical impulse and connectivity, but they can't explain God. You just can't get there with a physical reality. There's a dimensional reality that goes beyond that, and that's where the connection between the physical part and the dimensional reality of the spirit become one. And that's why the Bible was written for us, to know that, to understand that, and to watch science try to prove it and figure it out. And they'll get there eventually, maybe. But in the meantime, they'll come up with all kinds of things, and sometimes people lose their faith because they think, oh, no. But I only can tell you this in preparing for death. If you're not living your life knowing that God is real, there's no way you can be ready for life eternal without knowing that God is real. There's no way that you can prepare for death unless you know that God is real today while you're living, so that you'll know that there's eternal life to come, that you don't fear death in the life you're living now. And that's where religious people make the mistake, and you can see them by how they react to death. They don't really accept sometimes the fact that God is real, that God has spoken and God does reveal himself, and that, yes, when you die, we'll go to meet the Lord one way or another, either to the declaration that you know him, and Jesus will say, come, blessed my Father, or the declaration that he'll say to you, I don't know you, and then you'll stand before the Father, and God will say, okay, I'm going to judge you, but the way you're going to be judged is according to your own judgment, so let's go. According to what you think, you're going to be judged. And God lets you judge yourself according to your own judgment, and you wind up being corrupted, because everything that has breath and is created by the universe of God himself, creating the universe and everything that's in it, will at some point in time declare to the glory of God the Father and bow the knee that Jesus Christ is Lord, one way or another. And once you step out of this see, touch, feel kind of experience into a spiritual dimension, you'll be so shocked that you'll be willing to accept the fact that, yeah, you blew it, and you know it. Because then you know everything that you heard will come crashing in on you in a reality check that will send you to hell. And you'll accept that determination of your own choice, of your own free will, because you'll know you've blown it. That's why we take death so seriously in wanting to say to you, prepare to die. So you make those choices now that can't be reversed later. Death will be a termination of your ability to choose. You will not make choices once you get out of this existence as far as salvation is concerned. Salvation is for this life we live now. And that is why Jesus said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart as he says in the congregation. Because you are determining your own decision-making process of whether you live in eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. That's why you should plan. That's why you should plan carefully how you're going to die. That's why you should plan for eternity to pass through death and come out on the ground of knowing that God in you means you're going with God out of you to be with God where He is as He is with you now. So that's how you know you have eternal life. Because he who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. And that's all the gospel really is. It is the reality of knowing Jesus in you. Jesus in you by faith accepting what he's done for you. Jesus being the example of God's love proving to you that God loves the world so much that he gave his Son for the salvation of the world. That's why you and you alone should plan your death. You should not be self-destructive about planning your death, but planning what death does in the reality of you facing it face to face and not shirking, hiding, or running away from it. 
you should, whether you're a Christian or whether you're unsaved, you're planning your death. Because your salvation really is a determination of knowing not that you're going to die, but that you're going to live. And that's where death loses its sting. Because you know you're not dying. You're just changing your way of living. Thank you. 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 Th